Greetings and welcome. First, uh, let me say congratulations to our five finalists. This is so exciting, huh? <laughs> yeah, let's do it again. You know, I, I am jealous. This, this makes me want to be back in college again. You know, I once dreamed of becoming a novelist, and, and I did write a New York Times bestseller, but I'm afraid it was a nonfiction book about banking of all things. But because of that, because of those early aspirations to be a creative writer, the Sophie Kerr Prize really strikes a very tender chord with me. What a wonderful gift it is to have the financial freedom to pursue your writing career. And we all know pursuing a career in writing can be financially challenging starting off. So I really have great admiration for Sophie Kerr herself. She was a strong, independent woman, well ahead of her time, who lived life on her own terms and wanted to be remembered not only as a successful writer, which she clearly was, as well as editor, but as a patron of the arts. This year, this year we mark 50 years of Sophie, and tonight we pay homage to her legacy by inviting these fine young writers, our Sophie Kerr Prize finalists, to share their work. When she died in 1965, Sophie Kerr named Washington College a beneficiary of her estate. Lucky us. As she set out in her will, half of the annual disbursement of the fund goes to this incredible prize, and the other half brings noted writers to campus, provides scholarships, pays for books, and supports an array of literary activities for which Washington College is so well known. Thanks to Sophie Kerr's visionary gift, Washington College students enjoy a vibrant intellectual culture where the literary arts thrive and where our English department faculty have the privilege of working with some of this amazing young talent. Please help me give a warm welcome to one of those faculty mem members, Kate Con Moncrief, who chairs the English department and the Sophie Kerr Committee. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Great. <laughs> Take a little tension off up here. It's so nice to see everyone here. I'm really delighted that everybody could join us to honor Sophie Kerr's legacy and to support and cheer on our prize finalists on this important anniversary. As President Baer just told you, this is the 50th time we will award the Sophie Kerr Prize, right? <laughs> so I'd like to begin by acknowledging the faculty members in the English department who served as members of the Sophie Kerr Selection Committee and work all year as members of the Sophie Kerr Committee. They're down in our front row here. And I also want to bid a special welcome to former Sophie Kerr prize winners, several of whom are with us here today. So welcome, everyone. Uh, the reason we're here, we have on stage five incredibly talented young writers. In a few minutes, we'll listen to them read from their work. But I also want to acknowledge all of the students who submitted their work in consideration for this prize. It was an extraordinarily good year, which made the work of the committee a pleasure, a privilege, and a particular challenge. The students have majors or minors in English and creative writing. Surprise, right? No. <laughs> but also in American studies, anthropology, chemistry, gender studies, history, international studies, political science, psychology, and theater. Every portfolio showcased accomplishment in writing, whether it was a finely crafted poem, a surprising lyrical essay, a beautiful paragraph in a short story, a piece of journalism, an example of letterpress printing, or a meticulously researched academic essay. The students who submitted this year are a true representation of the liberal arts experience, as well as being a testament to the fact that Washington College is a writing school. We take pride in this. It's a place where, across the curriculum, we value and cultivate the ability to think critically and communicate clearly, where we appreciate the desire to tell our stories and the stories of others, and where students who love to read and write find a community and a welcoming home before they take these skills with them out into the world. So I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Sophie Kerr. It feels appropriate to me on this important anniversary. She was born in 1880 on the eastern shore of Maryland in Denton. And I know we have at least one other person from Denton here. So if that's your hometown, you share Sophie Kerr's hometown. 
She began college at only 14, and she earned a BA and completed a year of graduate study in history at a time when neither were common for women. Over the course of her 40-year career, she served as managing editor of Women's Home Companion. She published 23 novels, 500 short stories, and articles in the most popular magazines of her day. She wrote a play that she saw run on Broadway, and it was turned into a Hollywood film. I'm guessing it's also one of your favorites, 1934's Big Hearted, Big Hearted Herbert. Anyone? <laughs> no? OK. <laughs> She was a voracious reader and an industrious writer, and she took as her subject matter everything from love and romance to cookery and cats. Her novel, Tigers is Only Cats, is dedicated to her feline companions, useless and worthless. <laughs> you might notice on our, so on our 50th anniversary logo, we have a black cat. That's in honor of her last black cat, Zuzu. If you're wondering why we have a cat, Sophie loved them. Although three of her novels are set on the Eastern Shore, most take place in New York City and feature a heroine who makes her life there, as Kerr did after moving from Denton to Pittsburgh to New York. She was a successful, independent woman who supported herself on her earnings. In 1920, she purchased a brownstone on East 38th Street, and that became a center for her group of literary and theater friends. She lived there until her death in 1965 at age 84. In 1942, when Washington College was celebrating the 50th anniversary of co-education, Sophie Kerr was honored at commencement alongside First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. She remained friends with Washington College First Lady Helen Gibson, with whom she shared an appreciation for literature, arts, food, travel, and a deep fondness for the natural world. By 1964, Kerr had published the last of her novels, a collection of Eastern Shore stories titled Sound of Petticoats. That year, she invited Helen Gibson and her daughter Jill to her home in New York. We don't know what they discussed on that visit, but after her death the next year, the college received, as President Baer noted, over a half million dollars. In her bequest, she stipulated that half the annual earnings each year be given to a student, a graduating senior who, and this is a quote, who shows, quote, the best ability and promise for future fulfillment in the field of literary endeavor. Okay. The Sophie Kerr Prize this year, wait for it, $65,768. A moment to take that in. <laughs> right. It's a lot. This prize is the largest undergraduate literary prize in the world. Now, by way of comparison, this is larger than the National Book Award, the Pulitzer Prize, and the Penn Faulkner combined. Yeah, right. <laughs> Including tonight's prize award. In the last 50 years, we will have awarded nearly $2 million. Right. So Kerr, that, that's the splashy part, right? That's why we're here. That's the prize. But Kerr also specialized, or also specified that her money be spent on scholarships for young writers, on library books, on visits by writers and scholars. As a result, hundreds of well-known writers, including, and we could be here all night if I read the whole list, but I'm just going to give you a sample, including Gwendolyn Brooks, Billy Collins, Juno Diaz, Neil Gaiman, Lauren Groff, Ted Couser, Lee Young Lee, Colin McCann, Azar Nafisi, Maggie Nelson, Joyce Carol Oates, Claudia Rankin, Jane Smiley, Natasha Trethewey, Colson Whitehead, Jacqueline Woodson, and more. These writers have come to campus to read from their work, to teach, to lecture, to conduct workshops. So I think we can agree that Kerr's generosity and her vision have been transformative. Her decision to dedicate her fortune to nurturing and encouraging young writers has made Washington College a nationally known literary haven. And it's what brings us all, writers, creative writers and readers, scholars and students of literature, lovers of language and the written word, here today. So now I'm going to turn over the podium to my colleague, Dr. James Allen Hall, director of the Literary House, for one more introduction. We're getting there. Thank you, everyone.
Hi, everyone. I always like, oh, you're that kind of audience. <laughs> I like that. Um, so listen, uh, before, before I, um, I do my, uh, my duties, I just want to say to you five that I got here four years ago. Um, I've watched you, this is the first class that I've watched grow from freshmen to, to seniors. I'm so, so proud of the work that you've done and you should be very proud. And uh, to your family, too. And to your family members and loved ones, um, I'm sure you're all very proud, and I just wanted to acknowledge the work that you've done as well in supporting such great, great kids. Okay, so two more things I've got to do. First, to um, tell you all to please silence your cell phones. Um, and secondly, I have the, the fabulous honor of introducing uh, the poet and writer Elizabeth Spires. The purpose of a poem, A.R. Ammons writes, is to go past telling, to be recognized by burning. The purpose of a poet then is to imagine what can't be told and to risk trial by fire. And that is exactly what Elizabeth Spires does in her work, which uses description in order to springboard into hard questions that are so earned they have the heft of answer as well. Quote, what moments are these, she writes in The Bells, what ghosts descending, how shall we put them to use? With what abandon? The juxtaposition between use and abandon is characteristic in Spires' poems, and it lends them a philosophical dimension. The ghosts do not merely descend to teach us abandon. At the end of another poem in that same collection, Spires writes, let the dead learn from us. Indeed, in her work, the separation between the spiritual and the material realm is porous. There is an ethereal transaction. You know you're reading a poem. To stand in the light of the afterlife, to go past telling, as Ammon says, is no easy feat. And yet, for Spires, it is the source of incredible beauty and incredible fear, too. In Spires' ly lyric hands, the ineffable and fleeting is transformed for eternity. Quote, moments are vanishing all over the earth as bombs explode, Spires writes in Moment Vanishing, a poem which focuses on a dove that, quote, does not flash its feathers or want more than a few hard seeds that the finches have left behind. The speaker says, and if I were allowed a question, one question of the evening dove, whose pleasure is a few small seeds, whose heart I covet, I would ask, oh, what will I become? Not how will I become? Not what suffering or what joy will transform me, but what will I become? It's a necessary question. It has equal parts use and abandon. And it is a brave question, recognizing that burning is the beginning of becoming. The optimism is an effect of Spires' concept of time and how it folds back on itself and permits then a re-unfolding. It is also an effect of her incredible use of metaphor. I'm thinking now particularly about the poem Cemetery Reef, one of my favorite of Spires' poems and maybe of anybody's poems, which deals with a mother's lung cancer and also recounts a week spent in Grand Cayman when time, quote, lay suspended the speaker tells us that the cancer treatments have finished, that the mother's hair has begun to grow back. Listen to just a bit. All lies in retrospect now, how each afternoon we put on masks and fins and swam to cemetery reef. 
The coral looked like brains and flowers, like unreal cities of melted peaks and towers, pointing up to where the sun, flat and round as a host, lay dissolving on the water. I love how Spires transforms the coral into first brains and then flowers, then the unreal cities that point up not to the sun, but to the sunlight that lay dissolving on the water. That image of dissolution, of the caught light that cannot last in the medium which holds it briefly, there at Cemetery Reef, breaks my ever-loving heart. Elizabeth Spires is a poet whose gift is transforming the fire of experience into the cauterizing scald, who finds in the beautiful image a deep and sustaining truth, whose questions open for the reader wider vistas. This is a mind that interrogates reality using the poet's tools, sonic fabrication, burnished imagery, to remake the ways we inhabit a transitory, imperfect, and yes, miraculous world. Elizabeth Spires has written six collections of poetry. A seventh, entitled A Memory of the Future, is forthcoming from Norton next year. She has earned prestigious honors such as a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Whiting Award, the Amy Lowell Poet Traveling Poetry Scholarship, two fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Witter Binner Prize for Poetry from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Her poems have appeared widely, including in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, American Poetry Review, and elsewhere. The author, as well as three books for children, she is a professor of English at Goucher College in Baltimore, where she co-directs the Kratz Center for Creative Writing. Me, you, I, thou, all categories have begun to disappear, Spires writes. The dissolving of categories is one way of saying poetically what Ammons is after in his essay that, quote, poetry leads us to the unstructured sources of our beings and returns us to our rational, structured selves refreshed. This is what Elizabeth Spires accomplishes. The journey of the poem, the transfixing of time, the parsing of feeling into thinking and vice versa, so that when the poem, I could just as easily say the miracle, has concluded, we meet ourselves anew, transformed. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Spires back to Washington College. I don't know how I'm supposed to talk after that introduction. <laughs> that was just, can, can you engrave that on my tombstone? <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to start with a couple memories of Washington College, um, if you don't mind me being personal. It's really, it's wonderful to be here, and I feel kind of sometimes you feel in your life like a circle's being completed, um, and to be here for the 50th ceremony, anniversary of this ceremony. Um, as the program says, my first teaching job was here at Washington College, and it was in 1981. And I had been hired as a leave replacement for the fiction writer Robert Day. Uh, I was at the beginning of my writing life. My first book of poems was going to be published later that year. And now, I was going to have a chance to work with talented young writers that are just like the ones here, um, who were really at the beginning of their writing lives. Um, I remember that Bob had a kind of open door policy with the student writers. I discovered this after I rented his house next to the campus and moved in. I think the house has been demolished. There's a playing field there now. Night fell. And I suddenly noticed there were no curtains on any of the windows and no locks on the doors. And it seemed like some kind of metaphor. And then one night, a bottle of champagne was left on my doorstep with no note. And I thought, well, that's a vote of confidence. Um, 
I still remember many of the students I taught that semester. There was a senior, a very earnest, talented senior, who loved John Ashbery's poetry more than anyone else's and begged me to invite him to come and give a reading. So I did. And we all agreed that the senior should have the honor of picking up Ashbery at the Wilmington train station. But when she got there, he seemed to have missed his train from New York. She looked and looked, but she could not find him anywhere. It turned out he was waiting in plain sight, but was about 30 years older and much more grizzled than the really cute, sexy photograph he had been using <laughs> on various book jackets. And this, this senior came back kind of shaken and <laughs> crestfallen. <laughs> um, and I remember as my semester was coming to an end, the courtly gracious Bennett Lamond, he was a member of the English department then and um, he died this past summer. He gave me a birthday lunch on a beautiful day in late May. It was a lot like today, but not so hot. It began at noon. It continued into late afternoon. It was like some sort of slow motion scene in a French movie. Bennett lived in a large, comfortable house in the country, and none of us wanted to leave. As evening fell, Bennett brought out more food. It was the lunch leftovers and made this impromptu dinner. And finally, at around nine, he came out of the kitchen and told us, and it seemed with true sadness, that the cupboard was bare. There was no more food left. We'd eaten it all, and we all went home. <laughs> But for me, that nine-hour lunch, it embodies something about the kind of, just the generous, welcoming spirit of Washington College. And it also makes me wish we could just all slip out of time and our rigid schedules more often than we do, because we're always having to madly rush on to the next thing. But I'm here, I think, to offer some encouraging words about writing. Why do we write? because we love words and language, because we believe we have something to say, because we want to acknowledge the voice inside ourselves, because when we write, at least it's true for me, um, we get to make it, to have it, exactly the way we want it, without compromises or committee meetings. Your writing will always be yours alone, and that is a precious thing. An occasion like this calls maybe for some advice. As, as A.R. Ammons might say, one of my favorite poets, I cannot tell you or anyone exactly what a poem is or how to write one. As a Chinese sage might say, there are 10,000 ways. So instead, here are a half a dozen practical thoughts to take with you. Um, I, I wanted to keep this short. I, I had like 12. You know, I pared it down to, to, to a half a dozen. Um, first off, as you're packing to leave, keep those comments that your teachers wrote on your poems, plays, papers, short stories, and novels in progress. They were written out of love, not duty. How do I know this? How do I know your teachers loved you? Because if your professors were like mine, they told you the truth even when you didn't want to hear it. Here's a part of a professor's comment about a really bad love poem that I wrote when I was a senior in college. And I found it in, a, in, our, in many of the boxes in our basement. It's an archaeological mission going through them. <laughs> this, is, this is only half of the comment about my bad love poem. This shows your usual wit and skill. I liked it for that. Liked it in a positive but perfunctory manner when I first saw it. Rereading it doesn't turn it into a great poem for me. I do not feel your imagination is honestly behind it. It's what critics rather misleadingly call dishonest. The dramatic situation is fudged. The rat hole of surrealism is run to. The tales of many poets slip quick as a wink into those rat holes. But the dust of time is simply going to stop those rat holes up. And the last line, oh, it's so clever. It really is witty, but it may do the poem no good. 
what isn't made real can't be used. There's an impulse to say these things don't matter, but I think nothing matters more. So my feeling would be that this poem is part way to some place and needs more work, which is something pretty good, since most poems, not by you, are nowhere to no place. <laughs> that was kind, that not by you part. Um, for me, that's a comment written out of love, not obligation, and I will never throw it away. It's better than any photo album. Someone really cared about my novice efforts, and that is a precious thing. After you've left Chestertown, my second piece of advice is find a reader. It may be a writing friend from your college years here, a teacher, someone you know who doesn't write, or maybe a family member. This isn't about asking for more feedback about how to fix things. You're now on your own, and you need to make these writerly decisions for yourself. But you just need to know there is someone out there, one person, who believes in what you're doing. I had the same reader for 40 years. I think I sent him every poem I ever wrote and finished. And that reader is the person who wrote the comment I just read. Develop good writing habits. Try to write every day at the same time. But if your habits fail you, when you feel blocked or blank, go for a walk. Practice Tai Chi, take a bicycle ride, go swimming or to yoga class, because banging your head against the wall in frustration or fury is not going to summon that muse. Um, realize that the well-laid plans you make will get hijacked. Straight out of college, I went to a high-powered writing program in the Midwest, planning to write a first book of poems in two years. But I dropped out after two semesters with no cash in my bank account and no job prospects. So my two-year plan stretched into five years and then six. Um, with a couple detours along the way, I worked at a textbook publisher. Um, but have faith that the disappointing directions your life takes you in may also open doors and lead you somewhere vital and unexpected. The poet Elizabeth Bishop, who's another really favorite poet, she once described writing poetry as the happy accident. And it's certainly true for fiction as well. It's often the unplanned detour that leads to the wonderful poem or story. And connected to that, trust your radar. Follow the pull toward a street you've never walked down, a city or country you feel mysteriously and irresistibly drawn to. Find a way to do the thing you've always wanted to do, to walk the Appalachian Trail, to kayak around Nova Scotia. If you've never been to the Isles of Scilly off the coast of Cornwall, England, as I had not been, but you know you must go, go. Your subject may be waiting for you there. I believe we know sometimes, we apprehend something that's waiting for us in our future. You know, if you can just see a little photo of something and know you need to like follow, you know, get there. Um, know that success and failure are relative and that writers experience defeat and rejection their entire lives. Rilke said, the purpose of life is to be defeated by greater and greater things. And Samuel Beckett wrote, I put this on my office door, um, what he wrote. Ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better. Both are talking not just about failure, but about resiliency. The size of the rejection slip matters. I am still getting rejected. This is a rejection slip I really did get from a magazine last week. This is a really small rejection slip. <laughs> um, take heart when you get a rejection slip with an editor's little note at the bottom that just says, try us again. That's all, not even his name or her name, because he or she really means it. Oftentimes in literary life, there's only one named winner. So take heart in being a finalist or a runner up. Your moment may be waiting a little further down the road. 
Um, that's probably enough advice to pack in your suitcase, but one more thing. Um, you, it was said at the beginning of this, turn off your phones. The internet and the social media are some of the worst distractions ever invented. I came across a phrase in the New York Times recently, and it stuck with me. And it described the irresistible lure of the internet and social media as, this was in the Times, the always available elsewhere. It is almost impossible to immerse yourself in the present moment, which you have to do when you write, when the always available elsewhere is beckoning. It is just so much easier to give in to the temptation to check for a text message or Facebook a friend. I can't even believe I'm using Facebook as a verb, but <laughs> I think you're allowed to. Um, it, it's so much easier than to write a poem or a story. But there is, this is the upside, there is another always available elsewhere. It is the elsewhere that lies within us the deep, mysterious reservoir we draw on when we write. Rilke wrote a poem about that place and that process, and here is the poem. It's very short, and it's called The Walk. My eyes already touch the sunny hill, going far ahead of the road I have begun. So we are grasped by what we cannot grasp. It has its inner light, even from a distance and changes us, even if we do not reach it, into something else which, hardly sensing it, we already are. A gesture waves us on, answering our own wave, but what we feel is the wind in our faces. When you wholeheartedly let yourself be grasped by what you cannot grasp, then you will know you are a real writer. Thank you. So, so now we're going to have um, short readings by the finalists. And our first reader is going to be Allison Billmeyer. Allison. Uh, tonight I will be reading from my portfolio introduction as well as two poems about running. I can determine the day of the week just by looking at my hands. If they are marked with red ink, it is Monday, but if they are smudged with black, it is either Tuesday or Wednesday. If my fingertips are coated in lead dust from setting type, it is Thursday, and if they hover over the keys of one of the literary house computers, it is Friday. By the end of the weekend, my hands become a clean slate, and my method of timekeeping starts again. When I write about running or my travels, I'm conscious of the movement that is or is not happening in the moment. I wonder how this affects the speaker physically and mentally, the motivation behind their decision to either stand still or continue onward, and the implications of these choices that stick with them like an ink stain. In my running poems, the continuous demand on the runner's body has worn out her shoes, her motivation, and it's time to take a break. If movement is to continue, rest must be taken, and recovery is found in barrels. But when the runner remains stagnant for too long, choosing to lie with flowers, the body and the mind lose focus and drive. After such a long break, it can be difficult to find purpose, and this creates a sense of displacement. The runner finds, however, it is not enough to simply move the body, but the mind must engage in conversation as well. For how can progress take place if she remains silent? Tan line. She limps off the field wishing her school was not next to a farm. The runner has no more glycogen left to give. She wears sweat armor, having learned to bear the burning and lactic acid buildup better than those still racing on the stink field. Her tag number hangs from a single safety pin that snags on the clasp of the first aid box. She begins to remove her shoes, her socks, 
Her toenails are gone or blackened. Bent over, the elastic of her shorts marks completed miles across her hip bones. Her watch beeps. Beneath the time, her tan line reminds her that dedication only lasts a season. And this last poem is titled Ice Baths. We lounge on the loading dock behind the school after a workout until it is our turn to bathe. Putting our arms around the ledge of a blue plastic barrel, we lean forward over ice water, then hover knees to chest as if we are hesitant heiresses suspended above cold diamonds until our hands can't stand the ragged indents the plastic molds into our palms. With time, we've realized it is best to go in all at once, to let the needle numbing of the all over ice pack wrap our legs whole and settle so each partner can clamber in and raise the water over our waists. For 15 minutes, distractions are found in throwing those ice cubes into each other's barrels while our benefactors are occupied with the hose. Caught in the weaved ledges of braids, the crevice of an arm, the space within bras, get rid of this surplus, these chips that leave cool traces, until we heft ourselves out. Revlets running down red skin, we need our shorts, pick up our shoes with socks tucked inside and walk, bow-legged to our cars while coach overturns the barrels, spilling the unwanted wealth onto the pavement, the grass. Thank you. And our second reader is Ryan Manning. Good evening, everybody. I'm really honored to be up here with my amazing peers. Uh, I'm gonna read four short poems for you tonight. Um, and I just wanna dedicate my time on this stage and this reading uh, to my late father, Jeffrey Manning, uh, without whom I would never have come to this place or written this work. Um, the first poem is called The Virginia House. Three years at the Pentagon, he said, but my mother shook her head. For me, it was three years of a big brick, skin knee fireplace in a melted carpet living room, watching fireplace baseball sparks pop fly into the flimsy metal grate. Three years of saltpeter linoleum, high counter kitchen, faux wood cabinets, a backyard that seemed like the wilderness. Ours was a high on the hill house, hardy Japanese maple hanging out front. We had a bathroom, art deco, tile lime green and black, decorated by my brother with tiny drops of blood. The stairway had carpet soaked with coke, but it smelled stronger, and the dogs ate the ice cubes from the shallow glass. Behind it, the deep cherry dinner table my father never ate at. Three years of citrus quilted, top bunk ceilings you could stare at for eternity, a kind of stucco. Next poem's called The Bandsaw. Yellow sawdust trails from the table, too tall for the boy who watches his father's fingers flicker on the flywheel, guiding the thin screech up and up into the ringing in the air of an empty room. This poem's called Glioblastoma. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's a type of brain tumor. My father's morphine sits beside the pencil cup engraved with his initials. It is a small white box covered in gray labels between the printer out of black toner and the old iMac covered in dust. This room is painted in the green I chose and the desk is a bright plastic white which reflects the glare of the brass lamp my mother gave me. Above my head, a white cabinet stays shut on two photos and a pile of letters I don't want to read. I lean back on the creak of the loose pegs in my chair. I listen to his oxygen machine.
And the last poem I have for you tonight is called Funeral Reception. My mother lingers at the door, caught between handshakes and embraces by the last few to leave. The waiters clean tables around us while my brother shifts in his seat. Our aunt, the staunchest of the family, remains, feeding us slurred stories of Africa and weddings. As my mother drifts into the room, her sister orders another bottle of wine, and for the first time in decades, they sit side by side and drink their way to the kind of conversation that makes more sense. My mother throws up in the car on the way home. My brother is 17 and says nothing. I help her up the stairs. She asks to sleep in the guest room. Thank you. And our next reader is James P. Mitchell. Good evening. It is an honor to be here tonight. My writing illustrates narrative nonfiction fused with political science and is concerned for social inequality and inclusivity. I will read tonight from my uh, portfolio's introduction. My mother grew up in the Philippines. Once during her teenage years, military police stormed her family's home. My mother had decorated the house's exterior with purple ribbons in anticipation of her grandparents' visit. Her grandmother couldn't stand the sight of purple, and naturally then she decided to decorate and welcome her, great -grand her grandmother with purple ribbon. At the time, yellow ribbons stood as a symbol of the opposing party led by Nuno Aquino against the Filipino dictator Ferdinand Marcos. Living on a military base, my family was in the precarious circumstance of seeming to have defied the country's leader. But my family had not acted against the party in power at all. My family had only attempted to welcome my great-grandfather and great-grandmother, albeit in jest. Fearing any protest against its established government, the Marcos regime sought to quell any sign of opposition. Conditions had become so unstable that even a color could manifest the regime's insecurity, a manifestation that so clearly violated the rights of my family. At that time in the Philippines of Ferdinand Marcos, color had a great deal of power. Words much like the color feared by Marcos have harnessed a power and unlike any other. Words have built and toppled empires. Ideas are the quintessence of words, and words are the anatomy of writing. Like colors in that perilous context I've described, texts have long faced expunging. In spite of tyranny's efforts, such texts and the ideas they convey have survived, and democracy has flourished. Despite their shortcomings, democracies acknowledge the rights of their constituencies, or at least strive to. Today, the United States is home to an ever-changing and diversifying populace. The American people cannot be defined by any particular litmus. Instead, diversity defines the American experience. As we know from even the most superficial of histories, America has not always upheld the ideals upon which it was founded. For all of its historical challenges, diversity can and should be America's most championed virtue. For a diverse people to flourish, it is necessary to recognize the inherent value of everyone. In the United States, one need not look further than the First Amendment, which enshrines a commitment to the freedom of expression among others. A principled enumeration, the Bill of Rights stands for little other than theory if contained in a vacuum. Rather, these rights, inclusive of their implications, must be allowed to manifest themselves publicly. After the military police raided my family's home, my grandmother made her complaints known to the office of the commanding general. Like my grandmother, the purpose of my writing aims to address publicly the tensions between individual liberties and public life, 
how they cannot be contained in isolation. Indeed, a suppression of these human rights would be far worse than the challenges we witness today. It is the interaction of individual liberties in public life that so holistically contribute to a healthy democracy. And, and our next reader is Catalina Ryder. Hello. Today I have three poems for you. Route 213 Poet. Day in, day in, driving past signs for beer so cold it'll hurt your teeth. The peeling sway back porches, the men who yell as you pass. It takes a patient woman to look at so much corn. <laughs> Hemmed in by the rust undersides of magnolia leaves, you are hunting for a pleasure that does not promise soreness, cruising past each field with spooned out hope that the husks will flare rose gold for you and the crop duster will dip low over your car so you can finally write truth and beauty in one line. Um, I included both journalism and poetry in my portfolio, so the next two poems that I'll read, I think, exist in a space between objectivity and truth, um, and they each begin with a newspaper headline. Florida man shoots haunted cash register during graveyard shift at ExxonMobil. <laughs> I knew this carpenter who thought he was possessed. He made furniture so beautiful he thought it must be the work of Satan. So on a night like this, he ate his own hands, laid them down his throat, and touched each small bone of the trachea with a calloused fingertip. I hear stories like this from the customers all the time. So late they need something for the quiet, want to give me something for my troubles and my shining sleepless eye. The offerings pile up, and I keep them next to the register and the bowl of coins. Dead eyes, sliding door, red sign, sidewalk, my hand is in the night, and I am in it too, selling gas and pickled eggs, selling gas and swisher sweets, selling gas and dramamine, checking out. He lost touch, you could say, if you were clever. He did the Lord's work, you could say, if you were cruel. I am in the night, in the graveyard shift, burying my body under hours of silence, I am in the night, but my baby is too. Check her out, blowing in the, between the sepulchers. She is the only lively thing. She lights a cigarette, a little red sunshine. I want to give her something for her trouble. The way she puts my eyes back in their sockets gives my hands a purpose, touching each small round of her spine. Florida man steals weapon, bites security guard, flees, in gold convertible. <laughs> Oil up your machete. Tonight, we are cutting jackfruit, and the latex in its rag casing can stick. I'd say like, I'd like a little bit of slip to each of your blades, but that would just be flirting. Later, when the work is done, let me crawl into your belly, past your bony throat. Consumption is the only way I'd trust you to hold me. I'll whisper, seed bloom under spiked rind, a secret for bats to eat and shit. What grows is cross-pollinated, DNA rewriting itself on layers of ghosts. Maybe you're right about the car, or maybe the humidity wavered in the air and turned it gold. We fuel up and say our goodbyes to the Exxon, each gas pump a sepulcher for reptilian teeth turned under until they are black. People bury things all the time like this, waiting for them to turn slick. Hurtling down the road, we each pledge under a breath to tell this exactly as we please, nothing else. Thank you. Thank you. And um, the last reader is Lillian Starr. Hello, uh, thanks for sticking around. 
Um, I have two poems for you tonight. Uh, both are about growing up in a Christian household. Uh, Father, there is a man. Father, forgive me. Last night I wanted badly. When I was younger, I wanted to wash more than feet. I've never been drenched enough in water or otherwise. I apologize for this lack of baptism. There is a man in my class who looks like Jesus. He puts thumbtacks in my desk, my red fingerprints all over the room. If you connect them, they spell, I know I'm indecisive. In the stairwell between sleep and consciousness, I meet him. So much of me fillable, like an ice cube tray, or a glass still cold after the water spilled. And the second poem's called Psalm, and it's in sections. One, I almost killed my sister, her small throat a flower crumpled with oil from my hands. My father was so mad, he filled the room, he filled the house, he filled the pool, he became the backyard, always under me, growing, piling rocks around the house, to keep our white asses inside. In the spring, my father grew chrysanthemums. In the spring, my father said, try to kill me. And I pluck heads from their stems, leave a field of my father's fingers reaching for heaven. Two. On Sundays, I screamed from inside the house, but God told my father he must be louder than I. My father's voice was in the ceiling fan. My father's voice was on my pillowcase. My father started praying through a megaphone at breakfast, said that I must have faith as he does. I asked him if he would eat his grapefruit. Three, when I was young, I refused to bathe for weeks. My father grew again didn't want me dirtying his house. I told him Noah didn't swim either. Four, I love my father as Jesus loved his father. He makes me a crown of flowers, but the glue tears at my hair. I feed it to horses and they die. I bury them in the yard, so many bodies in my father. Five, when I leave home, my father writes me a letter which tells me to be anything but pregnant. It is still in my periphery, pinned above my desk like a cross. I will carry it. Father, show me your hands, the unbroken palms, the skin covering your side, how whole we both are. Thank you. Would, would President Bear please come up to um, be part of this very important announcement? It won't be like the Academy Awards, right? <laughs> on. Catalina Ryder is the winner of the Sophie Kerr Prize. very glad that I prepared something because I'm not prepared at all. Um, I wanted to thank, first of all, my family. I love you so much. Um, 
and I wanted to say that my most true and unwavering sense of self comes from you. Um, thank you to all of my professors, um, everyone who has been a teacher to me in my life, um, I, and I hope you see how exponentially the time that you spend on us is multiplied in our growth. Thank you to all of my friends, to everyone who's written here, to all of you, um, especially anyone who has trusted me to read a piece of their work. Um, that honor, I think, is the highest one to me. And finally, thank you to everyone who came today because you love someone enough to tell them to continue to write. Thank you. Gave a big round of applause, but I want to take one more moment to acknowledge all five of these incredible students. Now I would like to invite everybody to join us in the lobby. We're gonna go right down there and raise a glass to these five students, to our winner, and to Sophie Kerr's legacy. Thank you for joining us tonight.